John chapter 17. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep them, uh, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you all this morning. Um, having wrapped up a very detailed examination of the book of Proverbs last Sunday, we are beginning, as David mentioned, a new message series this morning on the gospel according to John. And um, should the Lord tarry, we'll be studying this fourth book of the New Testament for most of the rest of 2021, and uh, probably even into a little bit of the beginning of 2022, depending on how Pastor Bob maps out the whole study for us. So, And with Pastor Bob away this weekend, celebrating his birthday with his family, uh, he asked me if I would get us started on this series by giving kind of an overview of John's gospel as we look at its fit, its form, and its function. Its fit within the Bible, its form in terms of its structure and some of its unique features, especially in comparison to the other gospel accounts, 
And then finally, it's function or purpose. Now, when many people are um, asked to select a verse or a passage from this gospel to define its purpose, these two verses from John chapter 20, verses uh, 30 and 31, are often selected. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And while that's a good choice for a kind of an overall purpose of the Gospel of John, um, we're going to go a little deeper than that, with the, a little deeper than those two verses convey uh, during our study of John's Gospel, because we're going to take a kind of a twofold purpose, if you will that the Apostle John seems to have been given by the Holy Spirit, a, a twofold purpose that was very closely related to one of the major challenges being faced by the early church in the late first century when John penned this book, namely the challenge of Gnosticism, a false religion that sought to undermine the identity and the work of Jesus Christ. So first and foremost, it was John's intent to make the deity of Jesus Christ crystal clear to us something that was emphasized by those two verses from John 20 that I just read. John sought to make it absolutely clear that Jesus is God, the Son of God, who became the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, as John the baptizer declared in John 1.29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But then it seems that John had a secondary purpose, and that was for this knowledge of the deity of Christ to fuel the unity of the church so that the church could more effectively fulfill its mission in a climate where false teaching was very much on the rise. Hence, passages like John 17 that I just read, Jesus's high priestly prayer that is found only in John's gospel. So I read that full passage a few minutes ago, but I'd like you to listen once more as I read just verses 20 through 23. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That word one is the Greek word heis and it plays a prominent role in John's gospel account appearing some 33 times, including five times in just this very short passage I just read. And we often say that we need to take special notice when something is repeated in God's word. So I think this idea of unity in the body of Christ is clearly something Jesus wants us to take very seriously. Sadly, it has rarely proven to be the church's most notable characteristic over the past 2000 years. And then here's another way of looking at this twofold purpose um, for the gospel of John. So we have the deity of Jesus at the top, uh, where it says the Son of God sent by God to become the Lamb of God, and that kind of undergirds or provides a foundation for this unity of the church, where it says that we may be one so that the world may know. No, and what are the, what's the world to know? Well, again, that wraps back around to the first part, that the world is to know that Jesus is the one and only Son of God sent by God the Father to become the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So that's the heart of John's gospel, and it's a timeless truth that we need to hear, understand, and apply today. So let's get started by asking for God's favor on this study of John's gospel account. Please join me in a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning, grateful for this opportunity that um, you have placed upon uh, Pastor Bob's heart for us to take a very uh, detailed look at the gospel according to John. So over this next nine or 10 months, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to 
um, take a fresh look at this gospel account and to, and to mine truth from it that we can apply to our lives, but not just for our own benefit, Lord, uh, for the benefit of the church, that it would build unity in our church and in the church, but also that because of that unity and because of our love for one another, that uh, we would have a greater impact on the world around us, that the world could come to know the son of God that became the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we ask this in Jesus name, amen. So as many of you know, I've had the privilege of teaching a men's Bible study fellowship, also known as BSF uh, class here in Augusta for the past seven years. And I was telling David on Friday that one of the fascinating things to me as I prepare my weekly lectures for the men is the way the Holy Spirit takes people or events from my past or takes aspects of my secular work life and provides ways for me to connect them to whatever we're studying in BSF that week. In fact, the idea of breaking down a book of the Bible in terms of its fit, form, and function was a concept that the Holy Spirit gave me about five years ago when that BSF class was also embarking on a study of the gospel according to John. So I'd like to tell you the backstory behind that uh, before we explore those terms as they relate to John's gospel. My hope being that it'll help you remember them and perhaps even put them to use yourself in the future should the Lord give you an opportunity to teach his word to others. You see, those terms fit, form, and function are actually very important to the work I currently do as a quality systems manager. I've been at the same plant down in Waynesboro for the past 15 years, ever since Karen and I relocated to Georgia. And when I started work there back in February of 2006, uh, there were only 35 employees. And today the plant employs roughly 225 people. And where we once made about 1 million parts over the course of a year, we are on target to make about 20 million parts during this, coming, this year of 2021. So we've gone through a period of tremendous growth, especially over the past five years, as my company's benefited from some tighter environmental regulations that the EPA has kind of imposed upon automobile and light truck uh, manufacturers in terms of emissions. But along with all of that growth comes a lot of changes, because as I'm sure you can imagine, you cannot simply make 20 times more of something by doing things the same old way. You have to do uh, some things very differently, uh, and in some cases, a lot differently. And this, by the way, is an example of what we make uh, at the plant. Uh, we call it a honeycomb, actually, or an HCA, which actually technically stands for hydrocarbon adsorber. It's called a honeycomb. I don't know how well you can see that. And maybe the people on Zoom, I think Mark's going to zoom in on it. You can see it looks like a honeycomb. And I think you can see it here. There's a bunch of the different uh, types and sizes we make at the plant. And so you can see that grid on the top that goes all the way through the part. So if you hold these up to the light, you can actually see that light passes all the way through those through that little grid. So these parts uh, go into a special system on vehicles that collects the gasoline vapors that accumulate in your gas tank. And that collection system called a charcoal canister temporarily holds those vapors somewhat like sponge holds water. And then it releases them into the engine where they're converted to energy along with the liquid gasoline. In fact, in the United States alone, these systems capture the equivalent of 8 million gallons of gasoline every day. Gasoline that would have otherwise gone into the atmosphere as a pollutant. In any event, while we've had to make a lot of changes in recent years to support the growth of the business, this creates a challenge for us since our end customers, the car manufacturers, don't like change. Because with some 20,000 parts on a typical car today, there's a lot of things to manage. And therefore, they get very nervous when their suppliers want to make changes, especially after a part has already been approved and put into production. And then especially if those changes have the potential to affect the fit, form, or function of a part. So the fit refers to the ability of the part to connect to or mate with or join with another part within an assembly or a system. 
The form refers to a part's characteristics, such as its dimensions, its weight, or its visual appearance. And then the function refers to the criteria that are met when the part performs its stated purpose, effectively and reliably. Now, understanding whether changes that we make might affect the fit, form, or function is very important since changes that can affect one or more of those, but that aren't properly controlled or managed can often lead to an event that scares car manufacturers and their suppliers alike. And it's an event that is also none too popular with car owners, the dreaded recall. Because recalls are costly on many levels, kind of like unrepentant sin in the life of a believer. So that's the backstory of where I got this idea for examining a book of the Bible in terms of its fit, form, and function. So let's go ahead and do that now, beginning with its, uh, the Gospel of John's fit, um, not only its fit into Scripture as a whole, but the Gospels in particular. So a good place to start um, this analysis is with a quick synopsis of the Bible's makeup and core message most of which will not be new to you guys sitting here or the ones listening on Zoom. But as Pastor Bob often says, repetition is the key to learning. So the Bible uh, contains 66 books written by 40 different human authors, the majority of whom did not know one another personally. And it was written over a period of approximately 1500 years. There's actually three different languages the Bible was originally written in, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And it was written on three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And it contains many different literary types, including law, history, poetry, wisdom, and prophecy. What's more, uh, this book um, that we now call the Bible, this, or collection of books that we call the Bible, it shares a common storyline the creation, fall, and redemption of God's people. It shares a common theme, God's universal love for all humanity, and a common message that salvation is available to all who repent of their sins and place their faith and trust in God's only son, Jesus Christ. And then most important of all, the Bible's original writings are wholly without error in all that they declare. The Bible is the inspired, inerrant, an infallible word of God, and it can be completely trusted to provide all the information and instructions we need to live our lives in a way that honors and glorifies God. Now, while all scripture is God breathed, there are some books where the storyline theme and central message of the Bible comes out louder and clearer than others. And I think a good argument could be made that the gospel of John uh, is on that short list, and perhaps even at the top of that list. So let me next address the matter of the author of this book that we're going to be studying for the next nine or ten months. As strange as it may seem, you can actually find some different opinions about the authorship of the book of John, I suppose due to the fact that the author never directly identifies himself. The closest he comes to doing so is near the very end of the account where he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. The author then goes on to say in verse 24 of chapter 21 that this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. Now I'm not really sure how you can draw any other conclusion other than the obvious one that John the Apostle, one of the sons of Zebedee, wrote this gospel account. However, I thought I should at least mention this in case you happen to run into someone that has a different viewpoint. And if you do, you can now feel free to correct them. Now, perhaps you have been wondering why I've been trying to refer to this fourth book of the New Testament as the gospel according to John or John's gospel account, rather than simply the book of John or even just John. And there is a reason for this. For John's account is but one part of what the early church and scholars today often refer to as the fourfold gospel book or the Tetra Evangelion. The Tetra Evangelion. Though today we speak somewhat casually of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the early church spoke of one gospel. 
In fact, the plural gospels does not appear in the New Testament, for there is only one gospel or one message that the apostles proclaimed. The message is one, but the accounts are four. Hence, the title to John's account is best stated as the gospel according to John. And together, these four accounts give a wonderful description of all that Jesus is through four different emphases. Matthew's account emphasizes Jesus as king. Mark focuses on Jesus' humility as a servant. Luke's gospel account reveals Jesus' humanity as son of man. And John's account helps us to see and clearly understand Jesus' deity as the son of God and second person of the Trinity who came in the flesh to become the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So in the gospels, we have these uh, four accounts of the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But even the early church saw them in a three plus one way as they recognized that John's account was unique in many ways, just as we do today. As many of you know, the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are commonly referred to as the synoptic gospels. The word synop, synop, I can't even pronounce it, synoptic meaning with the same vision. Those three gospel accounts share much in common, sometimes using nearly identical wording. For example, almost all of Mark is in Matthew, 606 out of 661 verses uh, according to somebody that counted all those up and compared them all closely. Although Matthew often combines several of Mark's thoughts together and adds more detail. Also, much of the teaching of Jesus in Matthew is paralleled in Luke's account. Of course, you're always going to see some additional details as you go back and forth. So that's why it's always helpful where it's in multiple accounts. When you look at all of them together, you get a more complete picture. However, John's account uh, is remarkably different in content, with approximately 90% of it being unique and not found in the other accounts. We'll talk more about this in, uh, in more detail in just a little bit. On the other hand, one key similarity of all four accounts is their focus on Jesus's Passion Week, leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. All four gospels slow way down for that point of Jesus's earthly life, but this is especially true in John's account, where eight of 21 chapters take place over a span of time that lasted only about 72 hours. As a result, John's gospel account plays a vital role, both among the four gospel accounts and within scripture as a whole, in helping us better understand the Bible's central storyline theme and message. Now, it's often been said that one of the best places a seeker of God's truth or a new believer can start reading the Bible is with the gospel according to John. But its unique and timeless message about Jesus' great love for his children also means that its pages contain vital truth for every child of God. It's been said that John's gospel is shallow enough for a child to wade in, yet deep enough for an elephant to swim in. Another person expressed that same idea by saying that it is both the gospel for dummies and the gospel for theologians. In fact, it has something for everyone, and I'm excited to see what God has in store for each one of us as we explore its pages together over these next nine months or so. So let's uh, next uh, take a closer look at the form or the structure of the gospel according to John including an outline of the book and some details on several of its unique uh, features and characteristics. So let's uh, go ahead and start with an outline. Now, there are always at least several ways to outline a book of the Bible, but here is one possible way or one simple way to outline John's gospel account. As with the book of Revelation, John uh, begins with a prologue in chapter one, verses one through 18, and he ends with an epilogue. And in between those two bookends, uh, you have a two-step revelation of Jesus that makes up the majority of the book. First, the revelation of Jesus to the entire world, which goes from chapter 1, verse 19, all the way through the end of chapter 12. And then specifically, his revelation to his disciples in chapters 13 through 17. 
and a vital part of this very intimate teaching of the disciples revolves around Jesus's promise to send the Holy Spirit to help the disciples after he leaves them. And then finally, John will cover Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection in chapters 18 through 20 before ending with the aforementioned epilogue, which is chapter 21. And then one more thing regarding Jesus's revelation to the world in 119 through chapter 12, you're gonna see the same basic pattern repeated multiple times through those chapters. Jesus will either perform a sign or take some other striking action or make a claim about himself. For example, when he cleanses the temple for the first time in John chapter two, and then declares, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. These various events will in turn generate controversy as people either misunderstand him or just get angry about what he had said or done. And this will force people to make a choice about who he is. Is he who he claims to be or not? And Jesus didn't leave people a middle ground about that. He didn't leave them middle ground then, and he doesn't give us that option today either. Now taken together, the four gospel accounts provide a wonderful portrait of Jesus, but John's account is unique, not only in its fit as we discussed earlier, but also in its form and style. So a few of the other notable differences between the synoptic accounts and John's gospel narrative can be summarized as follows. First of all, there are a number of notable, what I'll say quote unquote omissions from John's account including such major events as Jesus's temptation, his transfiguration, and the institution of the Lord's Supper. So we just celebrated the Lord's Supper, but you won't find mention of that specific um, activity in John's gospel account. You will also not find Jesus casting out any demons in John's account, nor are there any parables in its pages. On the flip side, there are also some key inclusions, if you will, that are not found in the synoptic accounts, such as all of chapters two through four, as well as visits to Jerusalem prior to the Passion Week, the raising of Lazarus, and all of chapters 13 through 17. And these include the events at Cana, where Jesus performed his first miracle, or what John calls signs at a wedding, and his very important and intimate conversations with the Pharisee Nicodemus in chapter three, and then the Samaritan woman at the well in chapter four. Also John's development of the identity of Christ and his relationship to God the Father is much more extensive than what is found in the synoptic accounts. In fact, we see this right from the very beginning as the prologue establishes the identity of Christ and then there are seven different titles that are used for Jesus in just the first 51 verses of the book. Those titles are King of Israel, Rabbi, Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of Man, Son of God, and Lamb of God. And then spread throughout John's account are the well-known I am statements by Jesus that are unmistakable declarations of his deity as they reference the name God gave himself in response to Moses's question way back in Exodus 3, where God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. In fact, it's interesting. We often focus on this one set of I am statements in the gospel of John, but there are actually two sets of seven I am statements in the gospel. There are the seven declarative ones that we're most familiar with, beginning with I am the bread of life in chapter six. But then there are seven general ones or more general ones, let's say, culminating with Jesus's declaration in the garden of Gethsemane that literally floored those that came to arrest him. And I'll have a bit more to say about those special statements by Jesus when we talk about the function of John's gospel in a little while. Then another notable difference is that the tone of John's account is, uh, is also much more reflective. And it's in a sense, it's much more personal compared to the more descriptive tone of the synoptic accounts. While Matthew, Mark, and Luke record primarily what Jesus said and did, 
John's account gives special emphasis to what Jesus meant. Also interesting to note is, uh, and, and I love the way that David brought this out for us when he was uh, reading all the verses um, from, from John uh, the Apostle, from not only from the Gospel of John, but also uh, 1 John and Revelation. But when you compare John's account to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, you see that in the synoptic accounts, there's this emphasis on the kingdom of God, a future world that has been partially inaugurated with the presence of the king on earth. However, John uses the term kingdom of God only twice, both in chapter three when he's talking to Nicodemus, and he uses the word kingdom only three times, but he uses the terms life or eternal life 36 times, speaking of a present reality. In fact, those terms appear more in John than in the other three gospel accounts combined. And so while the other gospels emphasize the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, John instead emphasizes the new life found in Jesus. And I believe what John wanted his readers to know is that eternal life is not only a believer's future reality, but it is also our present reality, something that would have been especially important for John's first readers to understand. So those are just a few of the key things that make John's gospel account unique from the standpoint of form and style. Now, if you are already aware of most of what I just shared, have you ever wondered or thought about the reasons behind those differences? Well, I believe some, if not most of those differences may be linked to the timing of the writing of John's gospel account. While there are some indications that John's account could have been written as early as the mid 60s AD, most scholars seem to agree that it was written during the last 20 years of the first century AD, but probably prior to John's exile to Patmos and therefore before he wrote the book of Revelation. So this would mean that it was written 20 to 30 years after the accounts of Matthew, Mark and Luke. And as a result, it's probably pretty likely that John was aware of the other three gospel accounts when he wrote his account. And therefore he sought through the leading of the Holy Spirit to have a different emphasis from the other gospel writers. And the need for this different emphasis was likely driven by the climate that the early church was facing in the late 80s AD when John most likely wrote his gospel. For much had changed over the prior 30 years. Persecution of Christians had ramped up substantially. Jerusalem had been destroyed in 70 AD. And the false teaching known as Gnosticism that I mentioned earlier was gaining a lot of traction. For up until the mid to late 50s AD, Christianity was still widely viewed as a sect of Judaism and was therefore tolerated in the Roman Empire. But this begins to change fairly quickly shortly after Nero becomes emperor of Rome in 54 AD. And by the mid 60s AD, the persecution of Christians had become pretty intense. As for the rise of Gnosticism, it was perhaps the most dangerous heresy that threatened the early church during the first three centuries. Influenced by such philosophers as Plato, Gnosticism is based on two false premises. First, it espouses a dualism regarding spirit and matter. Gnostics assert that matter is inherently evil and spirit is good. As a result of this presupposition, Gnostics believe anything done in the body, even the grossest sin has no meaning because real life exists in the spirit realm only. Then second, Gnostics claim to possess an elevated knowledge or a higher truth known to only a certain few. In this regard, it has roots all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where Satan confronted Adam and Eve with his deceptive words. Gnosticism is derived from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. So Gnostics claim to possess a higher knowledge, not from the Bible, but acquired on some mystical higher plane of existence. Therefore, Gnostics see themselves as a privileged class, elevated above everybody else by their higher, deeper knowledge of God. 
And while Gnosticism was a clear present and growing danger to the early church, it is also something we need to be aware of today as it is experiencing a resurgence through something called Christian Gnosticism. Plus many false religions and cults adopt some of its tenets. But make no mistake, true Christianity and Gnosticism are mutually exclusive systems of belief. For the principles of Gnosticism contradict what it means to be a Christian when it comes to most, if not all, of the foundational doctrines or teachings that true Christians adhere to. Let me give you just two examples. First, on the matter of salvation, Gnosticism teaches that salvation is gained through the acquisition of divine knowledge, which frees one from the illusions of darkness. Although they claim to follow Jesus Christ and his original teachings, Gnostics contradict Jesus at every turn. For Jesus, of course, said nothing about salvation through knowledge, but rather that salvation is by faith in him alone as our savior from sin. And then the person of Jesus Christ is another area where Christianity and Gnosticism drastically differ. The Gnostics believe that Jesus's physical body was not real, but only seemed to be physical, and that his spirit descended upon him at his baptism, but left him just before his crucifixion. So as you can imagine, such views destroy not only the true humanity of Jesus, but also his atoning work on our behalf. For if Jesus was to be an acceptable substitutionary sacrifice for our sin, he had to be not only fully God, but also fully human and a physically real person who actually suffered and died on the cross. And therefore, a truly biblical view of Jesus affirms both his complete humanity as well as his full deity. So helpfully, I know that was a lot to swallow, but hopefully all of that helps you to better understand this overall uh, unique form of John's gospel, uh, especially in terms of that timing thing that was different from the other gospels. And so one result of this uniqueness, though, is that John's gospel is uniquely qualified in many ways to reveal Jesus Christ to our world today, a world that is increasingly being bombarded by false and deceptive teaching, much like the Gnosticism that the early church was dealing with, all of that teaching that ultimately leads people to hell. So this study of John's gospel presents a wonderful opportunity for us. But here's the question. Are you ready to take full advantage of it through your faithful commitment and preparation to reorder other priorities in your life to allow uh, this upcoming study of John to have the greatest possible impact both on you and your family, as well as friends and others in your life? So I wanna encourage and challenge us as a church to be extra diligent when it comes to understanding and then applying what we're going to learn over the next nine or 10 months. To talk about what we learn on Sunday mornings throughout the week and to actively participate in our Sunday evening gatherings when we often have the opportunity for further conversation about what was taught in the preceding week or two. And then of course, especially important is the opportunity for you to share what you are learning with others in your circle of influence. One way to accomplish this more effectively is to try to put yourself in the shoes of that first century audience as you read and study John's gospel account. Ask yourself often why John says what he says. Seek to understand the choices he made under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to record the events and stories of Jesus that he did. For in the second to last chapter, he states this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So this means that the things that are recorded must have a specific purpose that has a direct and personal application for you and I here in the 21st century. Well, this brings us to the final part of the overview this morning, the function of John's gospel. The function of John's gospel. Now, I already uh, kind of laid the, the groundwork for considering this aspect of John's gospel account back in my introduction. 
And as I stated earlier, the function of something is based on the criteria that are met when the part performs its stated purpose effectively and reliably. So here's that graphic that I shared earlier that illustrates the function or the twofold purpose of John's gospel account, at least from the, the way we're gonna approach it here at Family Bible Church this time around. So as I stated earlier, we have the deity of Jesus undergirding or feeding into the unity of the church that we may be one so that the world may know. And what are they to know? That Jesus is the one and only son of God sent by God the father to become the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So the gospel according to John reveals the deity of Jesus Christ more effectively and reliably than perhaps any other book in the Bible. And the deity of Jesus Christ is what makes Christianity different from all other religious systems of the world. For Christianity alone recognizes that Jesus is God and that every man, woman, and child is called to have a personal relationship with him. So there are three primary ways that John's narrative is gonna reveal Jesus to us as God, namely through witnesses, signs, and then by Jesus directly. So let's took a, take a look at each of those very briefly. So the first way that the Gospel of John proclaims Jesus Christ as God is through the testimony of many witnesses. So in chapter one, John the baptizer announces Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In chapter four, the Samaritans profess, now we believe, not because of what you said, referring to the woman at the well, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. That's in chapter 4, verse 42. Uh, in chapter 5, the unbelieving Jews understood Jesus was making himself equal with God. We see that in the 18th verse of chapter 5. And that quickly became their justification for arranging for his death. Then the man born blind realizes that if Jesus were not from God, he could do nothing. And then there is Martha's profession in 1127. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who has come into the world. And I think it's important for us to not miss the fact that many of the witnesses we will encounter in our study were ordinary people just like you and me as Jesus called ordinary people from all walks of life to believe in and follow him, something he continues to do today, and something he graciously allows us to assist with through our own witness of his faithfulness in our lives. Well, then secondly, John's gospel uses seven specific signs to proclaim Christ's deity. And these all occur in chapters two through 11. We have Jesus uh, turning water to wine in chapter two. We have him healing uh, the nobleman's son from a distance in chapter four. The healing of the lame man in chapter five, the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter six, shortly followed thereafter by Jesus walking on water. Number six, the healing of the blind man in chapter nine, and then the raising of Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11. And it's intentional that Jesus refers to these as signs and not miracles. For a sign is used to direct or point us towards someone or something, in this case, to the truth about Jesus' deity. And those seven signs all point us toward the ultimate sign that we find in all four gospel accounts, namely Jesus' own resurrection, which was God the Father's seal of authenticity upon Jesus' identity as God. And then finally, Jesus himself leaves zero doubt about his identity as God, as he makes emphatic and sometimes even startling statements about himself to announce his deity. These include his equality with God the Father, giver of life, judge of all. A couple examples of that are in chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, and also in chapter 10, verse 30. The fact that he is the bread of life given for the life of the world. So this is a, the series of I am statements that I referenced earlier. 
He also declares himself to be the light of the world, the one who gives freedom from sin. That's in chapter 8. Then in chapter 10, Jesus announces that he is both the door of the sheep and their good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus also proclaims uh, shortly uh, or during the raising of Lazarus that he is the resurrection and the life. And he is the only one who defeats and overcomes death. Then there's my personal favorite of Jesus's I am statements in chapter 14. It's kind of a three for the price of one declaration where Jesus tells his disciples that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And then finally, Jesus is going to declare himself as the true vine in John 15, as he reminds us that we are branches that can only bear fruit when we abide in him. For without him, we can do nothing. So as we study John's gospel together, and as you hopefully supplement that study with your own personal study on the side, I encourage you to continually ask the Lord Jesus to expand your capacity to perceive his glorious beauty in these pages and then respond with worship at every opportunity. Then also, as you study each of the proclamations by the various witnesses, as you consider each of the seven signs, and as you ponder the I am exclamations of Jesus, take time to magnify your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then look for ways that you can personally help and encourage others in the body of Christ in order that we may be one so that the world may know. So that's a very high level 10,000 foot view of the gospel according to John that uh, hopefully will effectively launch our journey uh, into this unique and special book. Just a quick look at its fit, its form, its function to help you be better prepared for the adventure that lies before us. It's a message full of hope and love and a call to faith. And it proclaims that Jesus is and needs to be the sole object of that faith in your lives and in mine. It's also a message with a strong call for us to repent and follow and to trust and obey. And it reminds us that the only life worth living is a life grounded and focused on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. But it is also a message that has been supernaturally crafted for you personally, uniquely inspired and authenticated by your creator. So I invite you to embrace this journey through John's gospel by inviting the Holy Spirit to help you take a fresh look at its deep truths with a desire to apply those truths to your life. I believe it is a journey that is going to bless us in ways we cannot even begin to imagine as we take a fresh look at the deity of Christ and behold the Son of God that became the Lamb of God to take away our sin truth that fuels the unity of the church so that by being of one mind and one heart, we can work more effectively together so that the world may come to know our amazing Savior. Now, as I wrap up this morning, I think it's just really cool what David did with communion, because as I wrap up this morning, the Holy Spirit inspired me to also break from tradition a little bit with what we normally do. So as you know, we normally have this series of questions at the end. Uh, that we ask. But instead of asking you some questions, I'm going to just read a series of key verses from John's gospel for you to dwell on that I also hope will whet your appetites for the banquet that lies before us. Now, I've already read some of these earlier. David also read some of the ones that I read earlier, and he also read some other ones that are up here. Plus, I think there's a few different ones that have not been read this morning, but it never hurts to hear them again. And the references for each of these are there at the bottom of your sermon note sheet, and they'll go up here on the screen as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at these together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the, one, as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The next day, John, the baptizer, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And I guess in closing, I guess I do have just one question for you to ponder after all. What are you going to do differently in order to take full advantage of our study of John's gospel account? So fasten your seatbelts. We are in for an exciting journey through the wonderful gospel according to John. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, getting us off to this start into the gospel according to John. Lord, just appreciate, Lord, the... Um, just the amazing nature of this particular book of the Bible. It's got such deep truths, but yet at the same time, many just simple declarations, Lord, about what uh, life is supposed to be like for us and the importance of love and, and living out our eternal life now in this world so that we can be faithful as witnesses for you. Lord, I do pray, Lord, for our church family that you would use this uh, time in the Gospel of John uh, to build unity in our body, but not just for our, um, the benefit of our body, Lord, but that so the world may know that you are the one that has been sent as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.